it's a Panasonic radio receiver. That winds up like a clock. Then it searches for radio stations. Let's do a teardown on this. I'll do a circuit description. Then let's fix it and see how this mechanism actually works. Should be a lot of fun. Let's get started. Here's the Panasonic Radarmatic radio that we're going to be tearing down, troubleshooting, and we're gonna bring it back to life so we can see how the mechanism works inside. So on the top here is the switch, auto tuning switch. We have an on and off, volume control, and on the side here is the manual tuning. So you can see that it doesn't engage the dial, but you have to push it in and then it engages the dial. I imagine that's so this isn't spinning while this is sticking out as the auto tuning mechanism is working in there. On the back, we have the wind up, which I don't know if it, well, it feels like it can be wound up still. A lot of winding actually. Hopefully the spring is actually working. Oh, I can feel more tension and that's it. So that's a good sign. The spring is working in there, so the mechanism actually isn't broken. We have a battery door on the bottom. And what we should do is put some batteries in it and actually see if it does work. Now I'm told it didn't, but you never know. That would sure make for a quick video, wouldn't it? Put this in here like so. Here. And here, all the batteries go the same way. Ooh, that's really loose. All right, so let's put the battery door back on and see what happens here. I can see what's going on. Good enough. Okay, on. And nothing to be expected. So I was told. All right, so now what we need to do is get this thing apart. So we'll get some tools, and we'll take these screws out and we'll go get my pry bar and we'll get this case off. All right, let's take those batteries back out again. Well, that top one feels like it just wants to fall out. I wonder if that's part of the problem. Okay. I'm wondering how this thing is in here. Because it doesn't look like there's anything to get this off from the outside. So I'm beginning to think that either it's attached to the back case or it's on a spline or something like that. Because it's... Uh, on there really good. So I imagine it would have to be. So now, let's see. Those are the only two screws. It's always a, oh, it's always the fun part is trying to get these things open because you never know how they put these together. Oh, I can see up inside there. See how that is on there. That would be kind of nice, wouldn't it? What I'm going to do, yeah, I can kind of see what's in there. I'm going to grab a small light here. Zoom on in here. Yeah, I see a brass shaft. And it does look like right at the bottom, I don't know if you can see that, it does look like there's just a touch of a spline there. And I can actually see the part in the shaft. If you can see that in there, right at the bottom. So you see right about here, you can see the little part in the shaft. All right, so it is spline. So that's a good thing. OK. 
Okay, so back you back out here. We'll see. We get this case open somehow. Looks like it. Looks like it wants to come apart pretty easy. So we'll leave that in there, and we'll get another plastic tool here. So sort of mar up the case. Hopefully, I can get this open with a plastic tool. Oh, maybe I can. Aha! Uh -huh. Success. Oh, look at this. It's coming apart a little easier than I expected. Oh, yeah, and it's actually coming off of that brass shaft up in there. You can see it a little closer now. You can see the spline. Get my flashlight here again. See the spline? So that is a nice thing. So maybe if I lift this carefully, looks like there's a little box around it. So I lift this carefully, maybe this will actually come off. I don't really want to pull this. I don't want to pull the case up with this on here like so. I wonder if I can get something under there and maybe press against the case and lift that off the spline. This is a little bit thick. I may have to use a metal tool and some finesse. Actually, I can put the battery door here. And I will just use this to lift. Look at that. Just like that. Pops right off. Okay. We're doing good. Oh, that's pretty easy to get apart from that point. Look at that. Oh, look at that crusty foam goodness in here. Oh, look at this. Well, that would be a reason why our batteries aren't very tight. So somebody's been in here and they've put some what looks to be thick paper or something in here to hold this in here. So the battery holder is broken, which is usually an indication that this has been dropped. And when these are dropped, usually the ferrite antenna breaks. Oh, what a surprise. Great. All right, some super glue will work on that. Nice, long ferrite antenna, right? They always, when these things are dropped, that's what happens. So, you know, damage, you know, number one, damage number two. Actually, these things go first. Sometimes the battery actually, uh, battery holder lives. So, we have a bunch of issues. So now we have red markings. Sometimes this is done at the factory. If I can get any closer. These red markings are done at the factory. And everything looks like it's pretty much in line with the red lines. Now, it's kind of a, a catch. You can see on the switch, it's got a red dot, which tells me this is probably factory markings because why would anybody put a dot on that switch, right? And it looks like the same red dot that's all the way around here. And they all look like they're pretty much in alignment. Now, that doesn't mean that this thing has been screwdrivered or not. So, you know, when people get in here, you're right, you know, People like to tanker and, oh, maybe I can make it receive just a little better and they like to screwdriver things. So a lot of the times, if you breathe on these things when you're moving them, uh, they'll go out of tune. And um, I imagine the, uh, the coil inside this thing that allows this whole system to work is uh, probably going to be pretty finicky. So lots of germanium transistors in here. I will go dig up a schematic and... Um, yeah, we'll take a look at this, a closer look at the schematic. Hey, look, we got some rules here, it says. Loosen the five red screws, turn on the power switch, push the manual tuning inward. At the same time, I'm reading this on the screen here, pulling the chassis out. Note, be careful not to damage or remove plastic cover sticked this note. Okay. So, um... That sounds like an invitation to remove this plastic cover. Okay, we'll take a look at the schematic and then we'll do that because um, that's just in the rules. Managed to find this really nice schematic. Look at how nice and clear that is. That's uh, kind of rare when you're trying to find schematics on these old radios. So we have the converter here, which is basically if you're working on a vacuum tube radio, this is the mixer oscillator tube right here. 
So we have a germanium PNP transistor here, and we have some interesting mixing. So you can look at these transistors like triodes, or you know, like you know, plate grid cathode kind of deal. Now, of course, a triode is closer to a FET, but you know, because we're using transistors, transistors are current control devices, whereas FETs are voltage control devices. So FETs are a lot closer to tubes, but still, this is a uh, a PNP version of a tube, you can picture a tube, but, but it, um, kind of the reverse function. So in a PNP transistor, so we have P, N, and P. So collector is P, we have the base, which is N, and then we have the emitter, which is P. So emitter is always the arrow. All right, so what that means is negative turns these transistors on. So you can remember that an NPN, an NPN transistor, where the arrow is pointing out on the emitter. So you go N and then P, so P turns it on, and then N, all right? So this is PNP. So this is kind of tricky, you know, like, you know, when a vacuum tube radio where you have like a 6BE6 and all the mixing is done in the tube there, you know, an oscillator running on a certain portion of the tube and then, you know, it's driving the IF transformer. Here, they're being a little bit tricky. So we have the oscillator coil down at the bottom here, and you can see the oscillator is fed into the IF transformer. So we're doing this all with just a single transistor here, which is kind of neat. So converter, basically mixer oscillator. We can look at this as an IF transformer, or you know, you can call it a uh, you know the mixer oscillator transformer. They're probably calling this an IF transformer. So we have an IF amplification stage here, right? So it runs in here, right, into the base, and then we have, you know, transformer coupled here. We have another IF amplifier transformer here, IF stage, and then we have that going over again. So we have two IF stages here, kind of standard for, you know, a superheterodyne kind of radio. And then we have detection here again. So this would be the detector, which is going to, you know, then go off to our audio stage here. So this is a, an envelope detector. Uh, we have another AGC here, so automatic gain control. So we have somewhat of a localized AGC, and then we have another AGC over here. Now, if you look here, you can see running off this side here, right? So we have a little bit of a filter network going on here. Off this side here, we run down over here through this resistor and then back up into this stage over here. And you can see we have a capacitor here. See this capacitor here? That would set the time constant for how quick the AGC goes. So if you were to change this capacitance value, you could either slow the AGC or, or you know, make it faster, right? So you can see how this is coming down, right? So basically like a feedback loop, right? This is running back here. So what happens in the AGC is when the signal is too strong, all right, what ends up happening is this supplies a positive voltage, which in turn wants to shut this transistor down. So basically, because N turns it on, right? So this is going to feed a positive voltage over here, and that positive voltage is going to try and shut this stage down. So we get a little bit of, um, as you say, automatic gain control. So it's uh, kind of, it's watching it for you, so you don't have to ride an RF gain control. So when the signal is, it's kind of like a compressor with audio, right? So, or a limiter, whatever. You know, when you're, uh, have a big, big signal, it's kind of governing it, and it's always keeping it at a level so we don't get any kind of overdriving happening. Kind of a neat system, right? Even the old vacuum tube radios have AGC in them, right, because it's, it's needed, or again, you would be riding an RF gain control on top of a volume control. Now, a lot of ham radio operators like to use the RF gain control. I, for one, sometimes it's beneficial, but, um, you know, it's uh, a lot of the time, it's just much easier just to have the AGC do the job for you. <laughs> So we have the volume control here, right off the same area, all right? So we have a volume control here, a blocking cap, and this runs into a DC coupled amp. You can see this kind of DC coupled amp down here. And this goes into a driver transformer, and then uh, we have push-pull output. So we're gonna have some pretty good drive here. Driver transformer, push-pull output, audio output transformer, and speaker biasing here for the uh, audio output stage. Now, right before the detector, we are taking the signal here. It's very lightly coupled, so uh, only about three picofarad into this. So this is gonna have to be a pretty sensitive little circuit because we're only, you know, it's just basically sniffing it. Three picofarad is almost like a capacitor known as a gimmick. And what a gimmick is, is it's usually a bunch of wires and they're just twisted together to give you a few picofarad. 
All right, so if you're ever working on older radio and you see gimmick capacitor, that means that it's uh, usually just twisted wires hiding somewhere in the chassis so you won't find an actual physical capacitor. But this one here, most likely, because it is a transistorized radio, will be a physical capacitor here. And uh, we have a thousand picofarad across here, so we're most likely tuning this. All right, so this is giving us our tuning here. And uh, could also be a bit of attenuation. Who knows what they're actually doing? It's probably a, you know, I would say probably causing, you know, to tune this coil, right? So we can't get much coil in here. So at that point, we have what looks to be a crystal in here. And then that uh, we have a, on the secondary here, the center tap. So this is going to be very sharply tuned, and it would make sense. So what's going to end up, this is what's going to give us our selectivity in order for this thing to know when to stop on the frequency, all right? So it's going to be, need to be very tightly tuned, and that's what that crystal is going to do. So we're going to have a very tight notch. And uh, so this is going to be very finicky. So as I was mentioning earlier, uh, chances are there's going to be a coil, right? That's going to have to be tuned very precisely. That would be the one, all right? Because we had, we're, uh, you know, got a little crystal inside this thing. So whenever you have a crystal in, a, in something like this, we're basically looking at, you know, crystal selectivity. So we're going to have, you know, our signal. And then as we tune it, as we come to the IF, it's going to be really sharp dip and then back up again. So we're going to have a really, uh, you know, tight response there. So we have a transistor here, which is going to be an amp. Yes, it is, trigger amp. And then we have another coupling transformer, probably somewhat similar to these up here, right? And we have another detector, it looks like. Yes, trigger detector. And then we have a DC amp, right? Same kind of deal up here, DC amp. And we have a coil with a fancy Z going through. Okay, so what that means, so this is known as ganged. Okay, so whenever you see this in a radio, you'll see capacitors with this symbol as well. And this is known as gang. So that means that these contacts are using this coil, and you see that Z kind of go through, and it's going down to these contacts. So this is a relay coil, and this relay coil is controlling these contacts and these contacts at the same time. So we have our battery here, so we close our switch. And you can see that we have our, our pass, so negative here, chassis negative. And we have positive, closing the switch here, running over here, running down here. And then we have this relay here with a switch. So this is the switch. So this would be in its normally uh, off position. So that would be when the switch lever is up. So when you momentarily press this, what's going to happen is we have our six volts here that's going to go across this. And it's on this side of the coil, we have chassis ground here. So basically, this relay has no choice but to close when we press this switch right here. Now, you'll notice that when we put batteries in there and we turned this on, or did we? Maybe we didn't turn it on. Well, I'll, have to, I'll have to double check that again. Maybe the switch was not on when I pressed the button. But if we put the switch on and we press this S1 here, this relay has no choice but to close. Okay, so let's actually do that right now. So, yeah, so this is basically closing this, and then this transistor here would hold this closed. All right, so this is pretty simple. So what's happening here is we have our signal coming through here, we have our, our very tight notch, and what happens is, is when we come to a station, uh, it basically biases this transistor off and lets this go. So when we first push, push this switch on the top of the radio here, when we push this, that's this switch right here. What it's going to do uh, is it's going to click in this relay. So on this here somewhere is a relay. We'll have to find that relay. So it's going to click in that relay, and that relay is going to latch in. This transistor here is going to hold it in until we get a strong radio station. That strong radio station is going to, once it gets onto the station, is going to bias this off, and this is going to let this go. So, and it, when it lets it go, it's going to stop on the station, which would make sense, because if you don't use this, right, the switch is going to be up. So that's how that works. Kind of neat. All right, so what we need to do is uh, put some batteries in this, 
and see if we can make this work here. So pardon this for just one second. What I'm going to do is uh, click this back onto continuous focus so that we can keep this in focus. Focus, focus, stay in focus. Okay, so there we go. And then that. Ooh, look at that. Blech. So did we get anything here? No, it is on. It was on. So there we go. And see, nothing's happening. So with the batteries in and nothing happening, we have a switch here, right? It's basically, you know, right through the switch, right through this or into the coil to ground, which almost tells me that there's something wrong with the switch right away. So if the switch is closed, that should click. And if something was wrong with the circuit, it would just let go, right? So you'd hear, you'd hear the relay go click, 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 click inside here, right? Nothing's happening. The only thing that's clicking, the only thing that's clicking in this is this switch here, right? We have a micro switch, but nothing else is clicking in here. Okay. So that's the rundown of the circuit. What, uh, what else can I tell you? All right, so let's start troubleshooting this thing and finding out, right? So this is kind of telling me already that this, this is almost at fault here. There's an open line, you know, from the positive, right? We have bad battery holder here, but I pinched that and it's um, still not doing anything, right? Bottom looks like it's making connection. So the power switch is up here. Do we have any... Uh, We do have wires up here. Let me move the focus over to this switch here so you can see the looks like looks like we do have connections here. And yeah, there are connections to the switch, and there are only two connections. Alright, so let's see if uh, we actually have anything on the switch. I'll grab my DMM. Something that's easy to see quickly here. Let's put this up here. Turn on the light. Hopefully that's okay to see. So, uh, chassis ground probably, I'm thinking, on this old radio. Let's find out. So let's go to, first of all, let's uh, see if there's anything on the positive here. No, that is on. Maybe the speaker isn't grounded. Let's find out. Let's see if that's grounded. Hopefully, push this in. Push that in. I am on DC volts. Oh, I am. Oh, there it is. Six point five. We're looking at our Duracells right now. The switch is on. So let's see what's on the other side. Nothing. Okay, you see that there? Hopefully I can get this all in. I need my uh, my remote meter so I can get this all in. So, this on. so 6.5 and nothing's on this side. So now what I'm going to do is just poke my probe in the center and see if this comes to life. Oh, I heard the speaker go tick. Here, let's see if we have any volume. Let's turn that up. Oh-ho! So you have a bad switch. Hmm. Bad switch. Now I don't want to spray any contact cleaner in here because look what's right below it. So if I spray contact cleaner on that, you know what's going to happen? It's just going to douse the paper in that speaker. All right, well, we're on our way to uh, making this mechanism work. Let's see um, if I can wedge something in there. Just to hold that tight. Boy, that battery holder is just done. 
Wow. Stay for now. Okay. Let's see if the mechanism works. Okay, I'll bridge this on. Oh, listen to that. I hear springy goodness. And it's turning the dial. I don't know if you can see that in there. The gear, see the gear in the bottom? So right now the dial's turning. But it's not stopping. So it's not detecting any stations, which isn't a surprise down here, right? In the lab, there is no... I wonder how long that spring will go. Wow. I imagine it's got to go for a good long time. All right, so let go of that. And uh, so I have to uh, cut the power in order to stop this. So yes, there is no detection happening. I don't know if there's any station. So let's uh, maybe I'll tune manually through some stations here and see if I get anything. So there's a strong signal there, right? So you'd think it would stop on that because it is an actual signal with some noise. Yeah, you see, that should stop it. That should. That should definitely stop that mechanism. So we need to find out why it's not stopping. So the radio is working. It's just basically a bad switch and a bad battery holder. And even with this crack in the uh, ferrite loop antenna, there, it, you know, it's, it's, it's still receiving really well, actually. As I say, if anything, if I receive anything down here in the lab, uh, this thing is working well. And you know what? I'm really surprised by these old germanium radios they, uh, they really receive well. And this is much like this, the Sony that, that um, we just looked at. You know, we, we basically have a converter and two IF stages. I mean, there's nothing special. We don't even have an RF amp in front of this. You know, so you know, these are fantastically sensitive old receivers, right? So, yeah, that's working. That, that tells me that the caps in this thing are probably even good still, right? You know, it, it's making a lot of noise on this end. So, so far, so good. So I guess the next step would really be to try to put this through an alignment and uh, take a look at the signal. So by what I can see here, if, uh, I can zoom into this. What is our IF on this? I may be missing something here. I'm going to have to dig through some more papers. I imagine it would probably be 455 KCs. So, you never know, right? So anyways, looking at the schematic here, I think the best way to tune this whole thing actually would be just to tie in down here somewhere. So, you know, either tie in over here. So we basically, we can tune everything all the way down right over to here, right? So we're gonna get lots of sensitivity if we, you know, say feed a signal into the loop antenna. So whatever the IF is, I'll look that up. Uh, we'll feed that into the antenna here and then just peak all of these stages, right? And then this is gonna come down here and then we're gonna be able to see if this is working. So this is uh, very important. I imagine we would want to tie in here or here. I'll have to look up some more paperwork on this thing and um, see what they want, but I would figure I would you know, want to tie in down here or up here. Uh, I don't think I'm going to see a signal here because of this coil. And then of course we have a decoupling cap across it. So we're not going to really see anything that's probably uh, 455 or whatever the IF is related at this point. So it's probably going to want to stop on this point right here because we have a bit of isolation here. So that's looking like what we're probably going to do. Of course, comes to worse, we can tie in here or here, probably 
we could probably peek it up by you know just listening to the speaker too. So we could tie in here or over here, but I'm gonna try then do this all in one shot. So I'm gonna focus on doing something down in here. So I'll get some alignment stuff set up and uh, we'll try to align this and see if we can make the uh, neat springy mechanism do its springy goodness. More paperwork found. So what they're wanting us to do is use a vacuum tube voltmeter and listen across the speaker and basically tune for maximum smoke. So what we're doing is we're feeding a 455 KC signal in here. That is the frequency of the IF. You can see 455 here. So they want us to feed that into the loop stick antenna, which is standard, and then peak up these IF transformers first. And then what we're doing is we're listening for the loudest tone because it's a 455 kilohertz signal modulated by, say, 400 cycles or something like that. What did they want us to modulate it by? Yeah, 400 cycle mod. So that's really standard. So we're listening for the loudest tone visually. So we're peaking those up and then as the tone gets louder, this needle is going to climb. And then for the second portion of the alignment, they want us to align this and this because you know, this is much tighter. So we can probably just align this by tying in down here. This is where they want us to tie in down here. You can see we're tying in at the collector down here. So they want us to tie in at the collector here at this point, go figure. So this is where they're asking us to do this. Now, if, as, as we know, we're, we're already hearing AM signals, so chances are the IF is somewhat aligned to that. We're gonna be able to get a signal through this. So I think the whole trick is, is to tune this first until we get a signal here and then if we get a signal here, then we can align the rest of this entire radio just using that. So we can really peak this up nice and sharp to 455 if we align this. So that's actually kind of a bonus. We can peak this up. Now that's, of course, if this crystal is going to work. So what we'll do is we'll tie in here, align this one first, and of course align this second so that we can get a nice signal through here. And then we'll go back and peak these up. If that doesn't work, we'll start up here at the speaker first and then move our way down. So I'll get the scope, I'll use an oscilloscope, just easier and it'll fit in the frame here. And I'll tie in at this point and I will get this alignment going. In order to tie the IF signal into this, I'm just gonna put a loop or two of wire around this antenna here. So go here, like so. So we're going to be putting 455 KCs in here is what we're going to be doing. If I can grab this wire, the batteries are falling out, that battery holder is just toast. So I think one loop is good, and I'll just put a twist in the wire so it stays there. An RF friendly twist. Put this back in, hopefully our battery holder is going to cooperate. Okay, so I get that ready. And let's bridge the on switch again. All right, so it's working. Now what I need to do is tie my signal generator into this. So I don't know where I stopped off last time, but let's see. Pardon the movement off to the side. I'll zoom you in, kind of. Hopefully this is gonna view this all right. So let's turn this on and see where I ended up last time. Probably did an IF alignment with this last and I did. It's at 455 at uh, 100 microvolts. It's a little bit shy on the signal. 400 cycle mod over here, which is uh, standard and it's 50% modulated. So I don't know if you can see, see that any better. I don't think so. It's kind of far away. At the other side of the bench. So 400 cycles in here and 50% mod in there. So I'll put this on here like so. And uh, we'll put these leads onto that. So I'll probably have to adjust the amplitude. Uh, everything else will stay the same. So I just have to adjust this. So which is the, uh, the amplitude of the signal here. The modulation is about 50%, which is fine. 400 cycles. All right, so we'll go back here again. Let's 
And I'll back that out just a little bit. Got the tuning tools ready. Oh, it's in there. It is there. I think this noise is an offender that I have here. What I'm going to do is uh, it's a, a lamp dimming control in here. So what I'm going to do is shut that dimming control off and uh, see if that helps it. Here, I'll uh, let you hear the difference. This is what normal household dimmers do to AM. All right. So if you have a dimmer in your office, if you have a dimmer in your house, you have a dimmer in your lab, normal household dimmers will do this. I'll be right back. So as you can see, that made quite a difference as I'm walking across all the way to the other side here. Okay, so now we can hear the signal in there. It's not very loud. That's 100 microvolts. So uh, I'll move this. I'll zoom on into that. Let's say uh, 500 microvolts. Well, that's much louder. Try one more. That's nice. Okay, let's uh, go with 500 microvolts first and see how that works. Okay. Okay. Got the scope on. Somewhat set to where it should most likely listen to 400 cycles here. So they want us to tie in, at least for the second portion. Oh, I touched the switch. I'll just let that run. See how long the spring lasts. It's hard to grab this without clicking that switch. And that's got some really good... Wow, that takes a long time to wear down, eh? All right, well, I'll tie in while I'm waiting for this. Oh, well, there we go. Okay, we're out. I guess in order to get rid of the switch, I'll need to do that again. So it latches. That's good. So I need to break the power there. Okay, so let me see. Got to get into a transistor lead down here. I think I'm on that lead. And, oops. This is so hard to grab this without clicking that switch. Reach over here, grab this. Modern oscilloscope. This is why old analog oscilloscopes are nice for this and for any type of sensitive work. directional antenna. So hopefully you can see this. I often get that question, Paul, why do you have these really large old tech scopes around? Because they're dead silent. And when you're working on sensitive circuitry, I have some plug-in modules for my tech scopes that go down into the low microvolt region. So when you're doing that type of work, like this thing here is only at you know five millivolts right now, right? And it'll go down, I think, to about two millivolts with a times one probe. Uh, you know, with these other modules, I can go down into the microvolts. So uh, I'll show you some of those modules. And uh, I've used, I use that for some of the things that I've designed and I've released on Patreon. I use that equipment. In fact, I use my old tech scopes more than I use this. This is just for camera work. So anyways, here we are. Let's see if we can get any signal. We should see something on the collector of this. Now, I'm not seeing anything there. 
This is a DC coupled amp. This is a DC coupled amp here. So we may need to click the switch in, which might be a good, re a good thing that that spring ran out. So we might need to click that switch in in order to see anything up here. And my scope just timed out. Come back on. It's like, hey, you're not giving me any signal here. I'm not seeing anything. I'm shutting off. Okay, so uh, let's push this. Uh -huh. Okay. That might have been a good thing that that actually spun out. So let's see if we can get anything here. Let's give it a bit more amplitude. I'll go to the signal generator and bring that up to one millivolt. Ha! Look at this. Okay, so let's let the switch go and see if we still get this. Okay. So I'll turn this back on. See? So they don't tell you that in alignment instructions. So if you're going to align something like this, run the spring out and then click the switch on and it should latch. If it doesn't latch, you'll need to get that working before you do the alignment. All right. So yeah, this is way off of that line. Look at this. How far off that is. I don't know if I can move this with, uh, again, the noise from that scope is just, you know, the screen noise is crazy. Look at how far off that mark it is now. That was pointing at the red line before. So that was way over here. So that's a long ways out. So if I was to, if I was to put that back at the line again, hopefully you can see all this at the same time. Focus this on the screen here so it stays locked on that. So I'll put this back to the line. That's at the line. There's nothing there. So this is working and it's very tight as well. So that crystal is working, which is a good thing because uh, look at that. Okay, so let's see. This metal tool is interfering with this just a little bit. That is so touchy. I'm just laying the tool on it. Look at it. It's a plastic tool. That's how touchy that is. So this is going to be, this could very well be the reason that this isn't working. There it is. Unfortunately, the plastic tool doesn't have enough um, rigidity to move this. So I'll have to fiddle with this just a little bit. I think that's about the maximum right there, right? So I'll just touch this with the tool here. Yeah, you can see that. It's that finicky. That technically needs a spot of wax or something on the top of that. Wow, that is touchy. That's about maximum amplitude there. Okay, so now that that is adjusted, I can turn the amplitude down. Now, I wonder, you know, I'll turn the amplitude down. So I'll go from one millivolt on the uh, signal generator over here. And I'll turn that down. Until I reduce that. That's quite a bit of signal there. I want to stay within the trigger. So I'm going to keep triggering on it. It is. Okay, so let's adjust the next one up and see what happens. So that's this next one here. You see how this is like, the metal is actually causing this, hopefully I can. Yeah, there is peaking there. Look at that, that came up. So that one is a little bit off, not too much. So let's go back. So all the metal cans are the IF transformers on this. It's pretty simple. So we'll go back here. Yeah, see it's how, how finicky this is, right? I have to use the metal end on these. These are pretty, pretty stiff, these things. Wow, look at how much amplitude we're getting off of this. Whoa! Okay, I'll turn the signal generator down. So yeah, this is definitely out of tune, eh? Okay, so now we're down at about 500 and something. 
that just spun the wheel. Wow, look at all the sensitivity we're getting. I'll turn that down some more. So this is going to be really sensitive. This is going to be way more sensitive after this is done. And these are way off. They're lines. So, yeah. Try this one. Look at that. We're gaining a lot of sensitivity here. So I'll turn the IF or the uh, signal generator down some more. To about there. And we'll go back right to the first IF. Look at this. Holy moly. Okay, so we'll turn this right down. We're at 300, 300 microvolts right now. Okay, so I'll see if I can get any more gain out of this. See if I can use the, this one is a little smoother. Maybe I can use the insulated end on this one. Wow, so I'll turn the signal generator down. So we're tying a 455 KC signal into the bar antenna and we're at 200, uh, 200 microvolts, 282 microvolts right now. That's pretty good. Okay, so I'll go back down one more time now that the gain is... Yeah, look at that, eh? Not bad at all. So we'll go back down here. Looks like there's something mixing in with that. And I think we're at our peak. I don't want to touch this anymore because we're right spot on with that one. And I'm pretty sure everything else is okay. So this is locked in now. So let's see if we up the signal and we can release the relay in here. So let's... Okay, let's see what we can do here. So 282 microvolts right now. Okay, so uh, I'll turn the volume. I think that's volume is up pretty loud on that. Let's spin this and see if we can make that relay release. It released. Yeah. So it is working. So I'll turn this down again. I locked in the relay. Okay, I pressed the tuning button. And I bring this up. That's the attenuator clicking in this. Oh, you can hear the relay buzzing. It's trying to release. There it is. So that took uh, 637 microvolts. We're on the millivolt scale here, but that's 0 0.6. So, so 630 microvolts to make that release at 455. So it released it, you know, like this is just tying in 455. This isn't tuned to that right now, so it's going to be much more sensitive on the AM broadcast band. So uh, this should be fun. So now I think this whole system is going to work, and that's basically just because this thing, somebody had screwdrivered it. Go figure. Let's just wind this up. It's working. It's working very well. So now I'm wondering, thinking if I can attenuate the signal just a little bit, see if we can hear just some strong stations. So let's try this now. 
Again, it's you know a real dead zone down here, but there's a radio station in there or some signal. There's another signal in there. I'm just hearing stuff in the lab. Signal there. Station there. It's working well. And it's stopping right on the signal too. Oh, it's working. We got it working. So there we go. So it's actually, it's working on its own here, because this did nothing when I removed this. Shut the scope off, it's probably making noise in there as well. Station. Some carrier there. Probably stuff in the lab. Station there. Another station there. Station there. Not bad. So it is working. Hey, you know what? We never removed this cover. Let's uh, let's do that. So I'll get rid of this. We need to see what's underneath here yet as well. We're going to do that, and we never did. So I think the battery's out, just in case I lose a screw in here or something like that. It looks like there's two small screws holding this cover on. Let's see what's underneath it. Probably that relay, right? Because we're hearing clicking. So that relay's got to be under here, because I don't see a relay anywhere else unless it's hiding behind or something like that. So, let's uh, see if this is going to work. It's kind of hard to do this with uh, keeping my big hands out of the, of the screen here. Out okay. A little bit of magnetism that's on here is doing its job. Yeah, see, it did fall in. So I'll hold those. There it is. A little screw. Don't want to lose those. Those are teeny screws. Okay, so let's see what's in here. I'm just going to give me one moment here adjust the iris here to get a bit more brightness going on. Okay. Is this gonna, oh, it is. It's really loose. Oh, look at that. There's that little relay. Go figure. There it is. Those are some pretty oxidized contacts. So let's see if we can see the relay in action. Okay, put that back in. Put that back on. Okay, so I'll turn that down. Watch. Okay. 
hopefully the batteries are making contact. That might be half of the problem. There we go. It would let go if it wasn't. We're running out of spring. We ran out of spring. So there we go. So that's the way it works. And it works not bad. Let's uh, get a close up of the uh, potato slicer over here. That's the tuning capacitor. So anytime this stops, there's enough carrier from some station or from some noise in there that it's actually stopping this. See right there, there's a carrier of some sort. Nice little ball bearing down in there. There's a radio station. Another carrier of some sort. Again, there's no external antenna attached. So there we go. Let's disconnect this. So it's alive, and that's how it works. We were so busy looking at the circuit side of this thing, we didn't even take a look at the dial spin. So let's check it out. I'll turn the volume up here. And let's see this thing work. And get the glare off the dial a little bit. It looks very Star Trek. So that's what it looks like while it's searching. And it's not doing too bad. There is no external antenna on this right now. It's just receiving, you know, what's in the lab here. So not too bad, pretty sensitive receiver. Again, you know, this would really benefit with an external antenna adapter or something on this. And then this would hear lots of stations, but then it would be stopping all over the dial. So we really wouldn't get to see it work as well. So all in all, neat radio and very neat mechanism. And you're probably saying to yourself, why didn't they just use a motor in here, right? An actual DC motor instead of a wind up mechanism. Well, now we're starting to get into a thing called commutation noise. Now, anything with a commutator, right, is creating sparks, right? Because you have a little DC electric motor and getting rid of commutation noise is really difficult, especially when the motor would be directly below the antenna here. So you can really see the engineer's thought process as they were putting this thing together. They obviously wanted none of that in here. And what's the perfect way to, you know, make a nice silent mechanism other than, you know, the gearing noise is to just use a spring wind up system. No DC motors, no anything like that. So technically this little mechanical area is completely quiet in this radio receiver. So it can be as sensitive as it can be. Neat design. Are you enjoying my videos? Well, if you are, let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and tap that bell symbol. That way you'll be notified as soon as I post a brand new video. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions, many of which you've seen on this channel before, you're definitely gonna to wanna to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. Did you know there's just under 200 videos there dedicated to teaching you electronics with circuits for you to build and all sorts of other projects? Definitely check it out. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the show more tab, and I'll pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on that link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.